Over the summer, we gathered a talented group of healthcare designers to meet with one of the industry's great writers and design explorers, Sarah Marbury. So we'll call this one a bonus episode as I hand the microphone to the talented Sarah to host this roundtable discussion. Thank you to Carly Schreider, to Sharon Kawaja, Jamison Delfino, and Emily Olson for the valuable dialogue on design. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, so the first question I want to ask you is, I was recently the lead author for a peer-reviewed article on healthy buildings for healthcare. And it was published in uh, the Journal of Hospital Management and Health Policy, which is read by healthcare executives. And in it, we defined healthy buildings as ones that do not harm people or the planet. So, how aware um, are your healthcare clients of um, their of the impact that their buildings have on uh, the people and the planet? Uh, there's a big healthcare giant, Kaiser per- per- Kaiser Permanente, and they are very, um, I guess, forward thinking in the sense of how their spaces impact their clients. And I think with working with Kaiser, um, you really learn what are the good products and what's bad. And I think the big thing with Kaiser is they do want to promote healthy environments, not only for their patients, but for their staff, and they want to promote well-being. So um, you have this really long list of things that you can't put in their buildings, but this really long list of things you can. So I think with working with their parameters um, that they've outlined and they've really vetted um, with their Kaiser-approved products, you can really design a really beautiful space that also has products that promote health and well-being and don't have those red list chemicals, which I think as a designer is a really fun thing to not only be a designer for that specific client, but also be an advocate for patients and their health as long and the staff members as well. So Kaiser seems like it's the exception to the rule. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. what what is, what is your <clears throat> what is your experience? Yeah, this? I mean, I think we still have a long way to go, to be honest. I Holistic health is something that everyone is talking about, but everybody hasn't fully embraced. And so we have a, we have some learning curves, and and we do try and bring it up, but I, I don't think that everybody's quite there yet. Um, I think it's getting better. So there's definitely large facilities that are making some decisions that you're like, come on, we could be trying harder together. And I think we just need to keep learning. We need to keep talking about it, um, and keep striving to do better because. These are people in buildings trying to heal. And so it needs to be healthy. It needs to, you know, practice what it preaches, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Carly, what's what's your take on this? <clears throat> well, adding to that, it, we're not only caring for the patients, but it's also, you know, the end users encompass the staff and faculty as well. And so it's reinforcing that healthy mindset. And I think to your point, Kaiser does do a really good job of vetting out a lot of materials. And I think that's reinforcing our own education in addition to bringing that to the forefront when we are working on other projects because some clients, they are also looking, you know, at durability and sometimes certain durable products, you know, they might not be as clean, um, but then we're also thinking about lifespan over time. So we might have a really clean product, but you might have to replace that product over a certain amount of years. And in healthcare, you know, we have about a 10 year, you know, plus or minus um, that we try to strive for. So I think it's just like a matter of continuing to educate ourselves, educate the client and have those discussions and make bringing, you know, sustainable and healthy products to the forefront, making it more holistic, as you were saying. So. Well, and there's a lot of initiatives in healthcare on the you know, the system-wide level, the associations to look at the, the cl- impact of climate change on, you know, uh, you know, and how that is affecting how buildings are designed and operated and so forth. So, I, I mean, I think there's more pressure from from other sources, but I don't know mm-hmm. how, you know, what I'm trying to get is, is, is it trickling down to your work? Mm-hmm. Do you have... Tri- wait, what do you mean by, like, trickling down? Well, to, this, like- this, this idea that, you know, the, the buildings that, you know, hospital buildings and clinics and all this, it, it, it's impacting, it's impacted by climate change. Mm. And um, and it's also, you know, affecting climate change because of, of the, the amount of carbon mm-hmm. that buildings use and stuff. And so, you know, just a lot of things don't get done in healthcare unless the client is really aware of it and is asking for it. Because mm-hmm. you can bring great right. ideas to the table, but then you know, if they're not listening, if they're not bought into it, how does it happen? Mm-hmm. They have to yeah, be ready. I feel like it's really a push and like a, a give and take when you're trying to like convince a client that something would be good 
not just for them, but for the health of their patients and for, you know, the environment. I feel like it's yeah that education of, you know, making a case for it, like, you know, maybe even if they haven't brought it up, like bringing it up to them and being like, you know, this material could be really good as a replacement for, let's say, like vinyl or LV, you know, LVT products, like maybe like a rubber material in like it maybe debunking some misconceptions, like maybe like they might think it's not durable enough or it's not, you know, going to hold up to like the test of, you know, a clinical environment. But if, you know, you can show like actual test results or like, you know, other examples and convince them that, you know, this will work for you, then, you know, it can, you know, you can change their mindset. So I feel like it's that give and take. And also, yeah, on on a building scale, like there's just so many other, you know, aspects like, you know, the amount of concrete is used in in building like that's a huge Mm -hmm. factor um so i feel like it's just it's it's a combination you know as interior designers but also working with you know other like the architects the engineers the you know everyone else to like you know from all aspects to bring it up at every stage of like how can we reduce you know the amount of waste and and um, negative effects we're having on the built environment. I think, I think one experience that I've noticed just with some of the healthcare giants that I've worked with is that when they think uh, green or healthy or sustainable, it's just dollar sign, dollar mm-hmm. sign, dollar sign. Yes. Some of these conversations about choosing a product that is more beneficial or has less phthalates or plasticizers or virgin plastic, I think when you start to go down that, you know, trail, you also have to have this mindset that I think when the client starts to hear these things, it's red flag cost, red flag cost, that's expensive, that's expensive, that's expensive. So I think when you start to have these conversations where you really want to prioritize the wellness of the patients and the staff and the faculty, it kind of has to be done in a way where you're also working with your GC who are oftentimes cost estimating all of these um, potential finish options. So I feel like it's this kind of team effort to tackle this conversation about um, providing the client with the healthiest space pro- like possible. Um, and it's really hard to have that kind of conversation without also understanding how much is this going to cost and what is the life cycle cost over time. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. So I think that's also a, a thing that mm-hmm. I've noticed, especially with. So it's making clients. the business case for it. Right. Not mm-hmm. only just the, right. the personal case that, you know, we want healthy buildings. But yeah. the business case, I mean, that's important, right? It's mm-hmm. very important. Yeah. And, and there's one other hurdle I think to get over is that the products still have some work to do. Mm. Like these are hospitals that are cleaned with bleach. Mm. And so, yes, we're going to use the sustainable material if we have the choice. Sometimes we don't have the product that has the sustainability in it that can withhold the cleaning maintenance. Mm-hmm. So that's so it's cost, it's it's cleaning and it's maintenance and um, it's education. And we still need to, you know, I think as designers too, like we inherently are just going to gravitate towards things that are sustainable because we know a lot more about the kind of damage that they're doing to the world. Sometimes I don't even tell my clients about it. I just sneak it in if I can, (laughs) you know, but there are times where it's implicated by cost and you can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's being able to have a safe space to talk about it too. This leads into my question about embodied carbon. Um, You know, that's become something that people are talking about right now and bodied carbon footprint and and you know interiors because somebody alluded to this earlier there's so many you know it's a 10-year lifespan you're renovating all the time interiors uh, have been you know people think that may, they may contribute more to you know um, uh, their carbon footprint print may be even bigger than just the building architecture and uh, or the building structure so um, so my question is, I mean, are, is this something you're thinking about and are you, what are you doing to, to help reduce the embodied car- carbon footprint of the interiors that you're designing? I mean, to be completely honest, that hasn't really been part of active conversations I've been having with my clients. However, I do think about that and some of the materials I do select, I'm, I try to keep that in the back of my mind. I mean, with specifying vinyl flooring, especially new vinyl flooring, it's oftentimes you're specifying a product that has, you know, virgin plastic and you're just adding more plastic in the process to create all of that new material. And then especially with the structure of the building with concrete, I mean, that has a huge embodied carbon footprint. And just how can we as designers be a little bit more smart, but also innovative in how 
we think about materiality and, you know, if we can make some substitutions, like what would those be and how, I guess, how do we lessen it? Maybe not overall, but maybe a little bit by a little bit. And maybe that's just the lack of technology or innovation. But um, I think that's something that, you know, I've been thinking more and more about lately. Mm-hmm. Well, and again, it, you talk about educating your clients. If you bring this this data and this this information mm-hmm. to them, it, it might be an aha moment for them, right? A hundred percent, right? Yeah. And I think at a number of our firms are trying to, you know, I think it it's in our scope that we are working on lead project, working on well building, uh, carbon neutral, also carbon positive, eliminating that carbon. Mm-hmm. So I. That is within that design world. I know our firm as well, HDA, is, has been focusing a lot of pro- mm-hmm. project work on that area. So mm-hmm. um, just, again, having it in the beginning of the process, not adding it on later, keeping that in the very forefront and having p- checkpoints and making sure that's still the priority, mm-hmm. um, you know, green and sustainable. There's mm-hmm. sustainability, I should say. Yeah. To add on to what Carly said, um, so that's also something that we've been having conversations about in our firm. So at HGA, there's been a lot of talk about how can we, you know, bring this up to our clients? Like, and it's it's because it is really difficult, especially with a lot of the really budget conscious projects to like be able to convince clients to even, you know, think about it or consider it. So you know, we there, you know, we've had like a lot of meetings, there are a lot of, you know, talks about, um, you know, different steps we can take. And specifically as interior designers, the there are recent initiatives that we just started hearing about or like that are being worked on to like our interior design. We have a few core people in, in our firm who have been working on sustainability um, for interior design specifically and interior materials. So like um, they've come up with like a whole guideline and list of, you know, different um, uh, companies, different um, websites that we can look at to find more, um, you know, sustainable products, carbon neutral products. And so, for example, with Material Bank, who um, we recently um, have like this joint pro or like collaboration with, um, they set up like a tab for HGA. And so what it is, is like it it automatically filters products that are carbon neutral or, you know, check these boxes of sustainable materials. And so a lot of, you know, that's like one step, but there are just a lot of other steps to, you know, filter out all of that bad product. So, yeah, carbon neutrality is a big one. And so, for example, with Material Bank, um, their whole shipping process is carbon neutral. So I love that. That, <laughs> that helps with that aspect. But but it's not just yeah. about specifying carbon neutral mm-hmm, products. Right. It's also can you reuse things in an mm-hmm, interior instead of right. just like ripping it out and throwing it away, right? Yeah, 100%. Right. Right. Yeah. 100%. Um, I know that there are some flooring companies that do have take back pro- programs where they will um, take back uh, basically the mm-hmm. demoed flooring material and then recycle it and reuse it. And that's available for you to add to your specifications, but you have to know about it. And mm-hmm. so it goes back to that, that whole idea of education and not only educating your clients, but also educating yourself. So there, there's a little bit of some work to do, but I think, you know, being committed to building and designing more carbon neutral spaces, you know, thinking about our carbon footprint. When we do order samples, mm-hmm. thankfully, Material Bank is carbon neutral, so it makes me feel a little bit better. But, um, yeah, I think it's a it's an education process for sure. And I think, you know, mm-hmm. I personally could do more and educate myself more. So that's something I've, I've mm-hmm. realized just from hearing about what your experience is with HGA and some of the thought leaders in your mm-hmm. own design firm. Mm-hmm. I think we, we know we have a role to play, uh, mm-hmm. all of us here. And our job is to kind of take in the information and share it with people. And that's not just clients it's also contractors like hey contractor right. this mm-hmm. is part of the process you also need to recycle that flooring mm-hmm. so it's just about taking in the information as much as we can and then making sure that we're practicing it ourselves mm-hmm. as well i think oh, yeah. all three of our firms at this point probably have a library that only has sustainable materials mm-hmm. and that's our dream that we can use those products and occasionally we can't and but we have to be able to say okay we'll use your product because you want to but this is why you shouldn't And we've kind of, you know, it's a small step. We've done our job of communicating. And then we're going to try again on the next one, Mm -hmm. you know, and maybe we'll succeed. So it's it's baby steps. But, um, yeah, it's very important for us all to be talking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And and how are you know are the manu- are, are manufacturers responding to this need for transparency for their products embodied carbon footprint? I mean, and are they doing enough? What what, what do you what do you think about that? Um, we've recently actually had a, a vendor, a flooring vendor, come in and um, they provided and you know, showed us their new collections. And we at the very beginning we wanted to let them know we actually do not specify vinyl. We completely avoid it at all costs if possible. Mm-hmm. And so I think that was an education moment on their end because they realized, oh, firms really are vetting this. Um, not to say it, you know, kind of threw off their presentation by any means, but at the same time, it was reinforcing really reconsider what you're putting in your product or what is that technology that um, that you're looking into. And we've we were sh- like we it was brought upon us that they are trying to test and eliminate vinyl from whether it's different kinds of flooring. But, um, you know, it's the technology isn't quite there yet to have it sustain over time. So um, and then that comes into manufacturing and mass production and and having that be able to uh, withstand especially healthcare environments. Um, so it's, I think, again, it's pushing, it, pushing each other and having everybody rise to that, to that level of standard. Mm-hmm. Well, an embodied carbon footprint isn't just the materiality of the product. It's right. how it's manufactured. It's right. how it's transported and all of that. I mean, right. are you having those kind of discussions with product manufacturers? It's a really great That is a great question. question. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like maybe not necessarily in terms of like embodied carbon specifically, but I know like recently, I can't remember which manufacturer it was, but like when we toured their showroom, they were talking about the whole process of like, we own the the mills that, you know, make the, you know, the threads. And I, I can't, yeah, I remember the whole thing that they said, but they they described how from the very beginning they're you know controlling the not just like ethics but you know environmentally how their product is being created so that whole um you know that streamlined process of you know very beginning like the plant all the way to you know the final product having that control i feel like that when they started talking about that i was like you know i'm really happy that you're mentioning this because it always is a question of okay the final product is sustainable but what about where you sourced your materials from like where did you get this material and yeah was it sourced sustainably where the people who had to make it you know where they paid what they should be paid you know so like it's like all these questions and I feel like that transparency is like still a very um it's not talked about enough but being out in the world and seeing how things are made are are going to leave a lasting impression on anybody and so the more that we can connect with these people that are actually making the products the more that we'll you know be able to feel comfortable using it as well yeah you know oftentimes we're taking a leap of faith because we're hearing one thing but i is that actually the way you're doing it right um so it's great to see how things are made it's great to just be out and kind of absorb So the next topic that I I want to talk about is this idea of designing for resilience. This has become like this other buzzword in the industry about resilient. And, you know, in healthcare, prior to COVID-19, we were talking about, you know, designing healthcare facilities to be more resilient to natural disasters. And that was kind of where the conversation was sort of focused on. But, you know, now and natural disasters that were brought on by climate change, basically. And now, you know, we're also talking about the need to design you know, pandemic resilient facilities. And, um, you know, so so I guess what I want to know again is, you know, how important is this? Is this something that's important to your clients? Are they talking about this um, in, a, in a new way, different ways? What what's your what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's very important to our clients. I think um, I mean, speaking from, you know, us being from California, California had a huge, huge uh, COVID population of just sick patients and hospitals being um, at max capacity and then some nurses being stretched to their thinnest. And I think our clients, especially our healthcare giant clients, have realized that we need to think about the future and future pandemics because I think problems like COVID aren't going to go away and we need to act and we need to be, um, I guess, proactive. And so some of the conversations we've had with our client in a project that I'm recently on, um, 
for our medical and surgery patient spaces, they had this one type, I think it was um, a chill beam HVAC system. And the client was like, wait, no, let's all switch it to an ICU level um, air and HVAC system. So potentially these could all become isolation rooms and or an ICU wing if need be. So it's really cool to see them thinking so far beyond because that typically doesn't happen with healthcare clients. I feel like they're pretty stuck in their ways or they move at a pretty slow pace. So it was really interesting to see them really make that that call just to completely change gears, which obviously had other design impacts and I think probably made our structural engineers and our mechanical engineers a little bit <laughs> on edge. But I think it was a very, very smart decision for them to do. And I think because they did that, I think that hospital is really going to be ready for the, the next pandemic, the next COVID. And I think just them doing that also sets an example for other healthcare providers to also, you know, consider as well. Yeah. What you're talking about is flexibility. It's like being able to be flexible in your decision making and then making the spaces flexible as well. And this topic is so interesting to me because healthcare facilities have always resi- designed for resiliency. Like they have to be resilient. They have to stand up. They're the safe house. They're where you're supposed to go. But it doesn't always we'll, work. You it know? doesn't like always New work. New Orleans, the, you know, when Katrina hit. True. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But I think the conversation now is how do you design for endurance? Mm. It's like oh, resilience yes. is one aspect of it. But if you just even think about when the pandemic started, these nurses were in there. They didn't know what was going on either. And they're like, okay, we have two weeks to get through this. We can do it. Okay. It's two and a half years later. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you design to make sure that they can be flexible and they can withstand for however knows how many time, how much time will pass, you know? So I feel like that's a, to think about resiliency is one thing to think about flexibility and endurance, like the three of those together. They're all different, though, right? They're that, very different. Yeah. You know? Well, I, as you were saying that, I was just thinking even about staff retention. I mean, there's they had to – a lot of um, nurses who were still um, in school, they had the opportunity to start helping. And it's not – I think they weren't even graduated yet within their program. But staff retention, the turnover, and with that, it's designing for them now and, and, and thinking about, again, the end users in all capacities and – um, how to uh, create a better space where that during their endurance, during during those long shifts, um, how is that built environment supporting, you know, their their like what they're providing for the patients? Um, so there was a little like Take, it's taking yours, care of the, the, the caregiver. I mean, right, and that's, this is a really important. I actually just wrote a blog post on this last week because it was National Nurses Week last week. And I started thinking about, you know, how. You know, nurses are the heroes of healthcare, really. And, you know, it is important to to take care of them. And I think COVID made everybody realize that, you know, these spaces that were, you know, these are the workplaces for nurses and how do we take care of them? And and it is about, you know, it, you know, creating spaces where they can endure, where they mm-hmm. can be resilient and, and so forth. Right. I mean, isn't that Absolutely. Part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've been talking about that for a long time. Right. Of, mm-hmm. That we need to put more emphasis on the caretaker so that they can take care better of the patient. Maybe the pandemic will actually put us in a better place. Like, mm-hmm. it's possible that, you know, we've always talked about, like, the room of respite or a cry room for the mm-hmm. staff. Like, they're having a really hard day in the ICU. They might yeah. lose somebody. They need a place to go collect themselves. Before the pandemic, that kind of space got eliminated. Right. Because, it, you know, there was more functional spaces outside of that that were prioritized. But I think at this point, the healthcare providers are heroes in all of our eyes. We know that. So I think it's going to be more important. So I'm very mm-hmm. hopeful yeah. that something mm-hmm. good's going to come out of that. Yeah. Well, and nurses shouldn't have to cry in the bathroom. I'll never forget hearing a story about that from a designer saying, you know, these nurses were crying in the bathroom and there That's was awful. no place for them to go. Mm-hmm. What are the components of, let's call it a resilient interior? What, what, give me some specifics here. Like, I was just thinking about that. And I think a part of it is the planning. So the thought that goes behind how spaces are organized and sized, I mean, with a lot of healthcare spaces, they're designed off templates. So they're very, they're very much like parts and pieces that all go together, almost like Tetris, but they're already pre-baked and pre-designed for a variety of different health codes. But I think, you know, maybe instead of keeping them at this square footage, maybe enlarging them. So if there is a point in time where you needed to have two people to a room, you're kind of thinking ahead and thinking, okay, this space could provide that function. And I think, too, um, 
you know, I think when it comes to planning, a lot of the conversations I think also need to happen with the nurses and the healthcare providers themselves to really get into their headspace and their mind and, you know, walk a mile in their shoes because how can we design for people that we don't understand what they do on a day to day? And I think some of the conversations that I have with end users are some of my favorite conversations because it gives me a snapshot into what they're experiencing and, you know, how are they impacted by these certain, I guess, planning choices that we make when we're initially designing these healthcare spaces. So I think um, really thinking about the planning and then also, I think, engaging with the end user and bringing them into the conversation as well. So you're truly designing a space to be resilient and functional for them. Mm -hmm. It's really important, I think. Yeah, I think flexibility and adaptability is yeah. is super important, and those mean different things. Mm -hmm. Like being like actually being flexible to a new process or a new way of working, I think is also very important. In in addition to the parts and pieces being adaptable and kind of moving around, and so part of this, like what furniture, walls, like, walls furniture, walls. and there's okay. some spaces where you just can't. Right, there are some right. spaces that are set, tried and true, and you can't move them around, and it's better to just renovate. And, and I think you kind of know those limits, but you can put efforts into, you know, say the waiting room, for example. Mm -hmm. The idea of waiting has changed drastically over the last three years. And so take this huge area that you had before that was the waiting room and see what type of modular pieces you can put in there to use it differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a while, people were even waiting in their cars at the hospital. Oh, house, yes. So. I did that many times yeah. during COVID. <laughs> yeah. So then, like, think about that. What can you give them in their car so that they feel still feel connected? They still feel like they're getting the information from whoever's inside. Um, so maybe there's a piece that we can start thinking about that, like, goes with people. I mean, of course, there's technology. There's apps. But I think hospitals are having that kind of conversation right now. Yeah. Um, and being flexible in those types of experiences. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? Kim. That's a great thought. Go ahead. Well, I, I, maybe Jameson and I were speaking about it, but just the anxiety, or maybe it was Emily, but the anxiety that arises when you're in a waiting area. Um, actually, my father was in the ICU for about four months at Cooper mm -hmm. Trauma in, in Camden for different reasons beyond COVID. But when you're waiting, at, you know, when you're in the waiting room, there is a lot of anxiety that builds up. And the space is really grand. It's a pretty new building. It's actually really lovely designed, but um, there's just a lot of anxiety. Did your firm design it? No, no, <laughs> no that'd be not. cool. That would have been really awesome. Yeah. Um, and actually, it was really, you know, as we're designers that focus in healthcare, but to be on that, you know, patient um, side, it really hits you differently when you really experience, you know, how how efficiency is and and um, circulation is so critical. Um, you know, adjacencies between the nurse station and the patient room, um, even you know the adjacencies of where everything is on the headboard, um, the the patient, uh, the visitors guest chair. I mean, we, I was sitting in a recliner and, um, another family member was at like a pull up and it, it, I actually still had issues, you know, pulling the chair and moving it. And just thinking about the actual like ergonomics and, and the anthropometrics and actually the end users, you know, interaction with the products itself. Again, this is kind of like a pivot, but no, I think it's, it's so important for us to get that experience, like post occupancy evaluations. And I don't know if we do enough of that. I have a number of friends that work in healthcare, and I'll hear feedback from them, and and they'll be like, "What what, what do you think the design thought was um, for designing it a certain way?" Because they see you know flaws because they are on that end user side. Um, so getting more feedback from from the you know from the client side really. Well, it, you know, it's interesting that you talk about your own experience because we're all healthcare consumers. Right. You know, Absolutely. you're healthcare designers, you're designing health healthcare spaces, but you're also a health healthcare consumer. And it, you know, so so I want to explore that maybe just a little bit more when you go into a healthcare space and I mean, are there it, obviously there was some learning experience there, but you know, what how does that affect you? as a designer. It's critical for us to design with empathy. Like we will not do a good job unless we can put ourselves in the shoes of whoever is using the space. And so the more that we can get out in the beginning of any kind of project and just sit there and take it all in and kind of experience what's happening and allow yourself to feel what the person next to you is feeling, mm -hmm. the better we're going to do. And so I, I don't know if that answered your question, but it kind of triggered that like thought well, of yeah. like, Get yourself in the space and put yourself in the head frame, and then that way you can you can approach it. 
But like, do you ever go way. to your doctor's office and sit there and say, oh, gosh, oh. they could do so so much better than yeah. just... Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I think we all, you know, have some sort of, you know, I guess, impartial or just judgment towards some of the healthcare spaces that we go to. And I mean, I think it's one, you know, it's how old the building is, mm. um, you know, is it easy to find your way to that, you know, healthcare provider? Are you going through a maze or is it really clear? And then, I'm, of course, I'm going to be like, it's, it's a little bit of a maze with some of the existing um, healthcare facilities. And then also when you're in the waiting room, you know, is it is it a warm, inviting space or is it, you know, very cold, harsh lighting? Um, am I in a row of seating and feel like I'm in a DMV? You know, I think these are all things that I take into consideration. I think another really big thing that I always take into consideration whenever I'm in a healthcare space is um, the amount of noise. Mm, yes. The yes. privacy between oh, right. my like my patient exam room versus another patient's. I've been in so many different healthcare environments where I can hear word for word what someone else is discussing with a healthcare provider. And I'm just like, Oh, I wish I had earplugs because I don't want to hear this. But also it's, you know, HIPAA violation. Uh, too. Oh, a thousand percent. And I also don't want them to hear what's going on with me. So I think acoustics is also really important, too, when you're thinking about these spaces is mm -hmm. the amount of sound. And I mean, hospitals are so loud, beeping, sirens, code blue, which is also very, very traumatic. If you've never <laughs> heard it, it's very scary. Um, and then just the amount of hustle and bustle. They're very loud spaces. So I think taking into consideration how are we laying out these spaces and how are we also um, addressing the amount of noise and can we still provide um, really nice soft spaces within these, you know, very clean and sterile environments that are still warm and inviting, but also help to mitigate that sound. Just to add on to that, that was, I mean, my dad was in and out of consciousness, but that was his primary complaint. Just he's already, you know, and has so much anxiety induced, but it was, you know, it's all the noises and sounds that constantly wake you in and out of it, out of, you know, your headspace. And um, they had a speaker. And so you would put on like a, you know, a, like a song or something to kind of get that sensory input. And, you know, that, you know, well, music and things that are familiar do a lot for your brain and it, it re-triggers memories. But um, the sound is such an issue, especially in critical care. And so oh, a thousand percent. Um, what can what can we do? Obviously, we can override some of that because that's in integrated into their system, mm -hmm. the healthcare system, they need to hear those things. But how can we soften that for the patients when mm -hmm. they're in those spaces and they're there for long durations at a time? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. potentially. So, well, and a lot of it also is the culture of the organization, too. I mean, I never, I'll never forget one time I was in going under for some surgical procedure. And the last thing I heard was them talking about the TV show that they had watched the night before. And I remember thinking, wait, do you, I, I can hear you and you're not paying attention to me. You're talking about this television show. You were, you know, so there's it's a little bit. But sometimes the design of the environment drives the culture. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. That's that's a really good point. And I mean, I think one nice thing is, you know, a lot of healthcare environments are becoming more and more collaborative. And I think um, the. The doctor to nurse relationship has been improving over time. And I think providing the spaces for that collaboration is great because I think that enhances the patient experience and the level of care that they have. Um, but yeah, it can be a little off putting when you're getting ready to go into a, to an operating room and you're hearing someone talk about, you know, days of our lives or, you know, what they just saw on the CW. It's 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 a little like. Uh, what's going on here? I'm a little confused. You know, I, I don't really want this experience. So, yeah, I think, you know, designing with, um, you know, the patients and how to control that noise. And then I think also, too, just acknowledging that um, the environment does impact, you know, how well patients recover. And I think, too, I always like to think back about some of the most vulnerable patients, those in the ICU, um, the neonatal ICU. I think those patients are so vulnerable and, you know, light, sound, color, materiality, I think really does affect these patients' recovery. And especially, for example, with, you know, um, premature babies, they're so infected by light because sometimes their eyes aren't fully developed. So we're looking at maybe providing a different kind of lighting system that we can, you know, adjust and control that's controlled by the nurses to really help aid 
that baby's um, eye development or growth. And then, or it's the sound because the sound is so loud that it stresses the baby out, raises their heart pressure, like their blood pressure, and then it could cause even further um, damage or delayed, you know, development and, you know, wellness. So I think these are all great things to consider. And I think, you know, as a designer, yeah, we have to kind of think about these people and be advocates and really um, champions to Mm -hmm. not only um, our clients, but to their patients and also to their healthcare providers. Mm-hmm. So it's you you wear a ton of hats as a designer yeah. for healthcare spaces. It's wild. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I think about that. Yeah, it's true. It's wild. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the storytelling is so important. Like mm-hmm. for example, I have a coworker who's six foot four. And so he recently told the entire firm about his experience of going through an MRI. Oh gosh. Oh, wow. you know, and it was very telling of, okay, we're not doing this right. And the whole my entire firm learned from it. So it's like when you take away something that can be helpful, I should tell you guys in detail later. I will tell you. It's like you can take it back so that you can use it when you're designing. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, design's impact on the social determinants of health. And this is kind of a complicated concept because the social determinants of health are, um, and and the U.S. government describes it as they're the conditions in in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. So, you know, some examples are things like safe housing, racism, discrimination, access to nutritious foods and physical, you know, activity opportunities. So um, is it, is it, I mean, how, how, my question is, how can healthcare environments be designed to be inclusive to support people of all needs, abilities, and identities? And is this, again, something that is important to these clients, your clients? Absolutely. It's so important. You have to know who you're serving. Mm -hmm. You have to know the community and every community is different. So it's very, very important for us to to do the research up front, to understand who the clientele is, to understand, you know, what type of users going there and what their family member might be like and how many family members they're bringing with them. Mm -hmm. Um, We we often kind of create these different personas when we're starting off um, on, on any kind of project where we identify, you know, a handful, maybe 10 different types of users that are coming to use it. So it's kind of taking that information, it's analyzing it, and then it's designing with equity to make sure mm-hmm. that every single single persona is going to be able to use the space and it's going to be good for them. It's going to be safe. It's going to be comfortable. Um, you know, superstition comes into play, culture. It's very important to, to know all of that to make sure that you're designing the right thing. Designing with equity is is a fairly new term, I think. I mean, is do people understand what that is? It's kind of like a it's kind of like a blanket term because it, it could be so many things. Mm-hmm. It's you know equity in the sense of um, you know you know making sure that all genders are accounted for or those who are genderless, like providing um, bathrooms for you know men, women, and those who you know are in between or neither. So I think taking that into account. And then I think also too, just um, depending on where the community is located, you know, they may be in a community that maybe is a little more underserved, but I think the quality of the design should not, you know, reflect that. I think they deserve equally as high design as, you know, some of our other more, um, I think, wealthier clients. And I think too, just taking into consideration, you know, the types of patients are these, you know, designing for younger patients, designing for um, older patients, designing for patients who may be disabled. I think making sure that all of these spaces are inclusive and people can use them regardless of, you know, their age, their their gender or, you know, their ability or disability. So mm-hmm. I think that's one thing I'd like to consider is making sure, you know, we've accounted for everyone and haven't left anyone out because I think everybody deserves a seat at the table and has a part and plays a role in our communities. Well, it seems to me like this is kind of a new, not a new thing, but, you know, it's really we as a society are more aware of this than ever before just because of whatever, how the times we're in and, you know, that there are so many, you know, different people out there, you know, wanting wanting to be heard. And um, 
but so to me that that offers maybe some new opportunities in design does that make it kind of more interesting and exciting for you as designers Absolutely. I think so. And I think we've had a lot of social and political things that are movements and beyond that, just really things that as a as a whole, as a country, especially in America, where healthcare is not accessible to all. And for us to be more cognizant and aware and considerate and inclusive and really kind of going back to Jameson, your point about understanding the, sur- the community that this facility is providing and, and getting their feedback and including them from the beginning to the end process who would want to have a space designed for them where their input is not actually being considered. And, you know, it's like hindsight or looking at it from a farther perspective. It's like, where were we in this process? Is this a reflection of us? And so I think that's super critical. And um, I mean, I only come from where I stand. I can only share as much from my personal experience. I cannot speak for everybody, but I think that is a huge proponent. And even coming down to the art that's considered and what is a common ground, something that all all people, all walks of life can relate to, whether it's nature, or whether it's, you know, certain bio, uh, colors, blue, green, but beyond that, just in general, how do we create a space where all feel um, safe, um, they don't, there's, there's judgment is not there, whether it's because they can afford a certain amount of health care from insurance, X, Y, Z. Um, and if anyone ad- wants to add to this, because if I'm rambling, please stop me. But <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're like, I feel like that. Yeah. Everything you said and, um, just a little of like, you know, making sure that, you know, we're talking to, yeah, the users, I feel like and what was mentioned before of like post occupancy evaluation of, you know, making sure to reach out even after the project has been designed and making sure that, you know, we're constantly questioning the people who are using the, the facilities like, is this still working because things are always changing and even communities, you know, change over time. So what, you know, a way a community was maybe now wouldn't be what it will be in 10, 15 years. And so making sure that we're constantly evaluating the communities that we're, you know, working with and making sure that it's just a constant process of of questioning them because they're they're the ones who are going to know best what they need. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's one of my favorite parts of design is, yes, we can't speak to everything, but we can listen to everyone. And I think that's a really, really beautiful thing about design is that we have the ability to listen to people to understand them it's this I think core part of the empathy in which we kind of operate and I find that to be truly humbling and probably one of my favorite parts of the design process especially with healthcare environments because they are anchors and they are kind of these um, places where the community has you know a strong attachment to because it serves the community and I think it's you know taking into account the community who makes up that community and really get them involved and, you know, engage with that design process, I think is critical. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think one of my favorite parts is just to hear people hear about their experience and really make sure that the design reflects those responses and shows that we were listening and we were taking everything that you said into consideration because I think most people don't always have that opportunity to voice their own experiences. So I think providing them space and a platform to do so, especially in our really beginning or mid phase user meetings or community meetings, I think is so, so critical. Also to going back to education, how can these healthcare providers, these facilities continue to educate their community, whether it's through free resources, if there's an information guide or an area in their facility providing those services, even if they themselves can't provide it, what are, what are, what are um, whether it's mental health or you know different like uh, occupational therapy, uh, physical therapy. What are resources for them to use? Um, so just continuing education because if there's a lack of it, then um, then there's going to be you know segregation in that. There, there's going right. to be difference in equity and equality. Well, and more and more healthcare healthcare organizations are are realizing that that's part of their role in their communities, which is really great. So you, you all, as designers, chose to go into healthcare design. And I want to know, 
what was your inspiration for that? And what would you say to, you know, students today to inspire them to go in this field? Because it's it's a challenging field, correct? I mean, it's challenging. It's definitely challenging. That's a great question and one that I love answering, to be honest, because I fell into it. I didn't choose to go into healthcare design. Hmm. Um, I got a job after I had graduated school as an intern and you know, after doing it a year or two, it was just providing so much value to my life, so much meaning, because I'm creating something that I can see is actually helping people. And so I will never leave it. I love it so much. Um, and I think that we kind of live in a society right now where providing meaning to your life is very important. People are talking about it. They want to feel fulfilled. Um, so as a designer, you look for ways to kind of get creative in, in, a, in a harder marketplace because it, it isn't quite as creative as some others, but you find ways to be creative that really fulfill you. Mm-hmm. And I find that to be extremely rewarding. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, young, young people that are looking to go into this field, um, they have to want more. They have to kind of want more from life and want it to kind of fuel them and it'll be right for them. Mm-hmm. Totally. And I think too, programmatically, when you think about a hospital, it's more than just uh, a patient and provider space. There's labs. There are offices. You know, it's it's more than just a healthcare space. So it, it kind of has this great combination of almost all of the different types of design, you know, um, which I find is really rewarding. And I think that's probably one of my favorite part is, you know, working with the plans to get the right combination of, you know, back of house, front of house, you know, making sure things are organized properly, I think is really fun to work with a variety of different people who work in the healthcare industry, I think is also really fun to hear from the doctors, but also hear from the people who might, you know, work um, in the admin offices, what is their experience, because Mm -hmm. they're at a desk every day, they're not an active um, participant in like the patient care like a doctor. They're not clinicians. Exactly, exactly. So what is their experience like? I think is really fascinating. And then what is the experience like for the people working in the labs, you know, getting all of like the the cath lab tests to people in the pathology department, you know, even the person who runs the morgue, you know, what are their experiences like and how can we make sure to, you know, cater to all? And I think that part is really what makes me fall in love with healthcare design is that it's really a very encompassing design so type. Yeah, it's, that's so it, true. It, there's so many, it, it's, and they're also very complex. It's like solving a really, really complicated yes. puzzle, mm-hmm. which I love. And each different um, healthcare project has always a brand new challenge and a brand new puzzle to solve. And it's really fun when you, you get it right. Do you remember, you probably remember when we <laughs> first started, because we're about the same age, I think, that yeah. everyone's like, okay, make your healthcare facility feel more like a hotel. So oh. infuse hospitality. Yeah. Right. So that was a thing for a while. And now recently, I feel like it's, oh, make it more residential. You want them to feel like they're at home. And which is which is true. So there's still things from the hospitality. There's still things from the residential. There's workplace. Mm -hmm. All of the markets. It's still a hospital. It's still a hospital. hospital. I I always hated that term hospital. Hospitality healthcare. I was like, yeah. this is not, it's it's still a hospital, <laughs> it right? Is, yeah. yeah. Well, well yeah. so you two have to chime in about, you know, how <laughs> you, why you decided to go into this um, field and what you like about it. And what would you tell students, you know, today <laughs> well, to inspire them to, to do it? Yeah. I mean, I guess for me, well, first of all, I'm not necessarily, I haven't fully set like my career path yet. So I feel like that's part of where I'm at is exploring different sectors. But I feel like One of the things that inspired me, you know, when I was interning, um, you know, yeah, back when I was still in school, I still remember, you know, the thing that inspired me the most when I was at my internship and which made me actually return to that firm was the healthcare meetings that I, you know, sat in on. And so like um, at the time they were working on a NICU. And so I remember it was a a meeting about, um, you know, the art that was going to go in the NICU and um, that just the level of depth that went into the conversation and the thinking of, you know, what kind of art do you want to show in these kinds of spaces? Because you don't necessarily want to show like pictures of babies or, you know, that kind when, you know, you don't know what the or well, you know that a family is, you know, struggling with their newborn baby. And so it's such a sensitive situation. So for me, that moment and being in that meeting was really inspiring for me. And it got me to really appreciate just how um, deep um, healthcare can be, how important it can be 
So for me, that I think is something that does draw me to healthcare. Um, adding on to what Shireen said, similar when I was in design school, I had an opportunity. Well, we were presented a healthcare project, which was our third year. And prior to that, I actually went to Cambodia for two weeks with a. It was a small group of us from design. And we went to the Tonla Sap Lake, which is the largest biosphere in Cambodia. And we went to the floating villages. And I really got to see firsthand how people, you know, a different group of people and how they live. And they like drink, they they fish out of, they use it for, you know, the restroom, the, the water that they have access to. And it's not clean. And it had a, such a big impact on me. And I ended up doing my senior thesis mm. based off of this community. Um, and that really, I already was interested in healthcare, but I realized how fortunate we are i mean it's from a place of privilege but we are so fortunate to have immediate access to healthcare in so many other countries do not and you know it, it was very humbling and um that really you know set a fire inside me and i realized i really wanted to either do work in healthcare or civic and community work and then there's also opportunity to tie the two together whether it's communal gardens you know aquaponics sustainable um projects such as like a sustainable garden and, and providing that back to the community so um similar to shireen i think i realized um that there was a greater i felt like there's a greater good that can come out of that and similar to what you both jameson and emily said um, there's a rewarding aspect to it. There's also a, a, a challenge, a technical challenge that comes with it as well. And um, overall, it's just I find it really rewarding. So, yeah. well, and 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 it's it's so it's so true. I, I, I mean, we we know those of us who are you know in the design industry that the design of the physical environment is important no matter where you are. But in healthcare, it's so much more critical because people are under a lot of stress. Not only the patients, the family members, the staff. And so how, you know, building design is even more important to that, mm -hmm. that, you know, population. It's important to all of us. But so that's, for me, that's personally what drew me to it is that, you know, we're making a difference, a real mm -hmm. difference in people's lives at a, at a time when, you know, that it's, I mean, not all healthcare experiences are bad things. I mean, you know, having babies and things like that is really is a good healthcare experience, but yeah. still there's stress associated with that too. But, um, you know, so it, it really is a very unique field, I feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very special. And I think one of my favorite parts about it is just, yeah, playing a role in that patient's recovery or um, I guess that patient's, um, I guess, like health healthcare plan to recovery, I think is, is so unique. And I think, you know, maybe it's like a little bit third party influence or be playing a third party role in just their overall experience. But I find that really, really rewarding to, you know, start from maybe planning to go all the way to post occupancy where you're seeing people use these spaces and you're like, that's why we do it. It's so mm -hmm. great. And I love it. And it's so rewarding. Like you said, it's, it's so special. And I don't know. I, I don't think I would ever want to stop doing healthcare design because I think, yeah, it's really you're serving a greater good and you're giving back. Well, the good news is you probably won't ever have to because healthcare is always changing and <laughs> things are always, you know, there's always something new happening. That is so. true. That is true. <laughs> For more design stories, visit us at ofs.com backslash imagine a place. Mm -hmm.